If your IFR checkride is coming up, or you're just looking to bone up on your instrument knowledge, we've got a terrific resource for you at Flight Insight. This is our IFR checkride at a glance document. It's a 15-page PDF that you can get delivered to your inbox by following the link here or in the description or comments. It's also now an official part of our full instrument online ground school, so students of that course have access to it through the course page. The way it's set up is designed to mirror the flow of the instrument oral or ground portion of the checkride. Let's go through a little bit of the content, and I encourage you to grab a copy and use it for your own studying. Now, when I run students through a mock IFR checkride, I like to approach it as if we're examining a real instrument flight, so we'll progress in chronological order from beginning to end. That's how this document is set up. The first step in any instrument flight is determining if a flight is legal to begin with, and that's what page one is all about. The question, is this a legal IFR flight, is a basic one, but it opens up a world of other questions which will test your knowledge of regs and other subjects. Let's also address a huge caveat on that asterisk, which is that what keeps you legal doesn't always keep you safe. It's important to be current for your flight for legal reasons, but it's also vital to remain proficient for the sake of safety. So let's break that, is this a legal IFR flight question into three sub-questions. Am I the pilot legal? Is my airplane legal? And are the flight conditions legal? First up, am I legal? You'll be asked to show your examiner that you meet the experience requirements to take the IFR practical test. So what are those? They're found in part 6165 of the FAR. Each one of our regulations cited will have a reference that you can use to go back and tag in either the FAR or the resource. We need 50 hours of cross-country PIC time, 10 of which are in airplanes. This can include the solo cross-country time you built getting your private pilot. You also need 40 hours of actual or simulated instrument time. That requirement is broken down into 15 hours with your instructor, which include what's often called a long cross country spelled out in those Roman numerals one through five, and then three hours of training and preparation for the test. We've left out endorsements you'd need for the check ride itself, like the sign off to take the knowledge test, the score report, and the sign off for the practical, since this won't apply once you're IFR rated. Now, once the examiner checks off that you've met those experience requirements, you'll need to show that you have the documents to be legal. You need your airman certificate, your medical, or basic med if you can do that, and a government ID like a driver's license. Now, once you've passed the check ride and become an IFR rated pilot, you need to maintain currency. 6157C breaks down currency requirements into three time periods, which we've marked as a green, a yellow, and a red. Green is in the past six calendar months. You have to have done six approaches, executing holding procedures and intercepting and tracking nav systems either in actual conditions or simulated. If you can't look back in your logbook and find this experience in the last six months, you're not in the green section and you're not IFR current. In the yellow section, you were current at the earliest 12 calendar months ago. This means that you can regain currency by doing those IFR procedures we mentioned, but you can't be PIC in actual conditions when you do them. It has to be with an instructor or safety pilot meeting the conditions listed here. If your currency is more than 12 months old, you're in the red section, the procedures we listed won't get you back to green, no matter how or with whom you do them. You'll need to see someone like me, an instrument instructor, and do an instrument proficiency check, or IPC. The required tasks are listed in the back of the instrument ACS, and the instructor will have to sign you off if satisfied. Now, just because you meet IFR currency requirements doesn't mean you're okay to act as PIC on the flight. Remember your PIC requirements from private? They don't go away after that check ride. You still gotta know them. We need to do our flight review within the last 24 calendar months with an instructor, which involves at least an hour of ground and an hour of flight instruction. They can be subbed by things like an IPC or certain check rides. How about passenger currency? We have to make our three takeoffs and landings within 90 days in the same category in class aircraft to be used before taking up passengers. If it's at night or in a tail dragger, the landings have to be to a full stop. The last one under this am I legal question could be a full check ride in and of itself, I think. The pre-flight info required for IFR 91103. You have to be familiar with these seven things, which touch on sources of flight information and weather, performance knowledge, and alternate requirements, which are all covered elsewhere in this document. Now let's look at the question, is the airplane legal? How can we prove the airplane we're flying today is okay for IFR flight? First, there are documents needed on board. 
The acronym ARROW helps with this, listed out here along with a citation where you'll find the reg. One gotcha with this is O for operating limitations. Many pilots think having the POH satisfies this, which it largely does, but section 2 of many POHs list limitations, which require certain placards to be in certain places on the aircraft, such as the fuel quantities on the selector in the Cessna 172. Those are part of the required documents too. Next is the maintenance inspections required. Here's another great acronym, AVIATE. It has two A's and the I is actually a one. It's the annual, which includes things like the inspection of the airframe, propeller, and engine, the airworthiness directives or ADs, which are specific to the aircraft and are released in an FAA bulletin. The sign-off of the ADs is usually included on the annual sign-off. There's the VOR check within 30 days, if VORs are gonna be used for IFR navigation. There's the 100-hour inspection, if the aircraft is used for hire. This one is usually applicable on check rides because you'll be in a flight school aircraft, which is of course operated for hire. The altimeter systems, both pressure altimeter on the transponder and the static system for the instrument, have to be inspected every 24 months for IFR flight. The transponder has to be tested every 24 months as well. The emergency locator transmitter, ELT, needs to be tested every 12 months more frequently than the altimeter and transponder. The way I remember that is because the ELT is for emergencies, it's important to test it more frequently. Also, the battery has to be replaced after one hour of continuous use, or if it's past half its useful life. On your check ride, your instructor or flight school will hopefully tab off and go through with you where in the aircraft's maintenance logs you can find that these required inspections have been completed and signed off. Next is our required equipment. We've broken this down into three different boxes below with their own acronyms. The first one is the famous A Tomato Flames. I personally have never been a big fan of this one, but it's popular and a good way to list everything out. I personally like to start from the most basic aircraft and work out from there. In green, we have the six things that every aircraft, even something basic like a glider, require. Three of them are instruments and three are other equipment. There's the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the compass, and then there's the anti-collision lights, the ELT, and the seatbelts. The anti-collision lights are only required if your aircraft was certified after March 11, 1996. Aircraft from earlier, which is like basically all trainer aircraft, are grandfathered in. If you can remember that, you're more than halfway there. Now let's add an engine, like for a Cessna 172. Now what do we need in addition to those six things? We need a tachometer, an oil pressure and temperature gauge, and a fuel gauge. You can work up to other required equipment for your aircraft too, such as landing gear position lights if you have retractable gear. So those are our daytime VFR requirements. The next box is additional night equipment required. Use the acronym FLAPS and realize that fuses are not usually needed because many aircraft use breakers, the landing light is just if the flight is operated for hire, and the anti-collision light requirement, while a repeat from above, has a different grandfather date in 1971. The third box is for IFR. It's everything we talked about, a tomato flames and if night flaps two, with the addition of the items listed in the acronym grab card. For radios and navigation for the route, this would be like VOR receivers, but it also means GPS units, which need to have current databases to qualify. You might notice altimeter is a repeat from the first box. This one mentions a sensitive pressure adjustable altimeter, while the original day VFR requirement doesn't specify. Most altimeters in aircraft today are going to satisfy that IFR requirement as long as they've been inspected. One other thing to call out is what's not included here. Of the big six instruments, one is not required for VFR or IFR flight. It's the vertical speed indicator. The other five are required along with the other equipment listed. Going back to the 30-day VOR tests, we see the various ways in 91171 that the test can be done, the allowable tolerances, and how to log the test. Last in this section is inoperative equipment, 91213. If any of the equipment mentioned in the three colored boxes isn't working, you can't fly without a special air permit. This is very often erroneously called the minimum equipment list or MEL. The MEL is a specific list of things that have to be working in addition to what we listed out in the colored boxes and is specific to a type of aircraft. Our trainer aircraft like the Cessna 172 or Piper Cherokee won't have MELs, so don't worry about them. For any other inoperative equipment, you could still fly if you determine it's safe to do so, but you have to remove the in-op equipment and make a log entry, 
or placard it as in-op. Here's a gotcha question. If it's daytime IFR and your Cessna 172P model from the early 80s has a beacon light that won't turn on, can you fly? The anti-collision light is listed as required in 91205, but notice for daytime VFR or IFR, it's only for aircraft newer than 1996. Our P model is grandfathered in. If this were nighttime, the date is 1971, so we would need to get that fixed. Rolling along to our third question in the is this flight legal journey, are the conditions legal? First, when is our IFR rating required? We need to be IFR rated when flying an IMC, obviously, but we also need it in some commercial flights not in IMC, and in Class A airspace and nighttime SVFR. How about what qualifies as IMC? This gets into our basic weather minimums. There are many ways to present the different VFR weather minimums in different airspace. For A through D, we have them listed out. For E and G, we have this chart. I found this to be a good way of organizing the different regs. Next to the conditions requiring filing an alternate. This flowchart has all the info. The big takeaways are the 123 rule, meaning an alternate is needed if the weather one hour before and after our arrival fails to meet 2,000 foot ceilings and three statute miles visibility. And the 602 and 802 rule, the minimum forecast weather allowed to use an airport as an alternate with a precision and non-precision approach, respectively. We have IFR takeoff minimums not strictly required under Part 91, but still important to know and follow. We should also know where to find non-standard takeoff mins. We have the conditions requiring filing a flight plan and receiving a clearance, any IMC flight and controlled airspace A through E. Finally, we have our fuel requirements, which is where the alternate we choose will affect how much fuel we have to bring aboard. So that's page one. Just to answer the simple question, is this a legal IFR flight? The rest of our check ride at a glance takes a similar flow. We go into what you need to know about your flight instruments, how to plan a flight and get a clearance, departure procedures, minimum IFR altitudes and how to read them on an en route chart, en route procedures and loss comms, VOR navigation, types of airspeeds and altitudes, arrival procedures, holding entries and procedures, procedure turns, all kinds of approaches and how to read approach plates, how GPS works and all the different acronyms, weather reports, charts, and how to decipher METARs and TAFs. Basically, if it's on your check ride, it's in our document. You could take any one of the pages like we did today and conduct your own mock check ride or have your instructor drill on it with you. All of our IFR online course students have access to this now as of today, and you can get yours for free following the link here in the video description or in the comments. As always, head over to the Flight Insight website for all your flight training needs. See you there.